Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. Um, this study today is going to be on, Did Paul Always Name Names? I've heard this from a brother in Christ, and I've heard other brethren repeat what he said. And he's paid, you ever heard of a PWC? Polly won a cracker. Bottom line, it just goes around in a circle, and just people are parroting. You teach a parrot to repeat the words that you say. It's called Polly won a cracker. So you're just repeating what someone else said, and it just keeps going in a circle and circle. Paul always named names. Paul always named names. And um, sometimes you'll get the answer of, yes, he did. The end. Uh, okay. Um, is that how we're supposed to be, brother, sister, in Christ? Oh, just take my word for it. Just take my word for it. If it comes from a man that you are respect, remember we did a huge study on respecter of persons where you have men. Paul was warning about this. Who, I'm, some of you say, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, uh, I'm of Christ. I mean, the Lord and his word is supposed to be our final authority, okay? But some of you, brother, says Christ, and I failed this too, we fall into the trap of being a respecter of persons. And if that man behind the camera, if that man behind the pulpit, Someone that we esteem and lift up high. If they say it, then it's got to be absolute truth. All right? Just take my word for it. Now, this is me, brothers and Christ. This is what I get. I go, yes, he did. When I ask somebody, he's like, yes, he did. The end. It's like, uh, and just take my word for it. Oh, you want more? Well, Alexander the coppersmith did be much evil. There was one time, there you go, I gave you one example in the Bible where Paul named names, therefore Paul always named names, therefore just take my word for it, okay? And anyone that does not name names at all, all the time is a Catholic papist. How many of you heard that? If you don't name names all the time like Paul did, you're a Catholic papist. I don't know if I'd go that far, that's to call someone a Catholic papist, and we're going to talk about that about calling them a Catholic papist because they don't always name specific individual names. Okay, as we're going to find out in this study, uh, then Paul's a, pa a papist. Then Jesus Christ himself is a papist. No, they're not. Okay, be careful when people start making all these... trying to. But here's the thing. Or should we do a Bible study to find out? Here's my thing is, oh, you want more? Well, Alexander the Coppet, okay, there's one time. But you didn't say that Paul named names sometimes. That's not what you said. If you said Paul named names sometimes, then you gave a good example. 2 Timothy 4.14, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. There you go, that's a good example. If you just said, yeah, Paul named names sometimes. But that's not what we're hearing, brother Jesus Christ. What we're hearing is someone makes the statement that Paul always named names. See, that changes everything. Okay, you could, you have to, all I have to do is show one time where Paul didn't name names, and it destroys that whole teaching and that whole saying of Paul always named names. All I have to do is prove it once that he didn't, and it debunks it, right? And I'm going to show several times, okay, where Paul did not always name names. Okay. And then when you say Paul always named names, what you're doing is Paul said, be, we're going to get into this, be followers of me as I am of Christ. So then you're saying Jesus Christ always named names. No, he didn't. There will come a day when Jesus Christ will name names. You'll be called up to the judgment seat by your name, brother says Christ. The lost world will be called up to the judgment seat of Christ by their name. People will be called by name and be in all their sins, all their bad works that get thrown, good and bad works that get thrown in the judgment seat of Christ. They're going to, at the great white throne, they're going to be held accountable to the book of life. Uh, they're going to be held accountable to the Levitical laws. And they're going to be judged by the only man that ever kept all the Levitical laws, Jesus Christ, the perfect man. All right? But we're going to go through this. When someone makes that statement that Paul always named names, our first thought is, is what saved the scripture? That's why I said, oh, you want more? Yeah, I want more. Just your word is not good enough. I'm sorry. Even if it's from someone I highly respect and believe, you know, for the most part, it's right on with Scripture, you still, this needs to be our final authority, not me, not the men that are parroting this, this statement, the word of God. So, yeah, I want more. So here's one incident. Okay, but here's the thing. You said he always names names. Therefore, I should be able, if I so much as grab one time in the Bible where he didn't name names... That debunks that whole statement, right? And I'm going to give the best example I can where in the same subject, 
He, he names names, and he doesn't name names. Over here, he's not naming names. Over here, he is naming names. And it's on the same subject. There's a time and place to name names, and there's a time and place not to name names. All right. uh, turn to 2 Timothy 2.14. 2 Timothy 2.14 in your King James Bibles for English-speaking people. Right. It reads here, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. What's words to no profit? Well, I, f I feel it's this way. Well, I believe it's this way, but I feel it's this way. Well, my feelings, my opinions, I think... When does this come into it? Verse 15. Let's keep reading. Verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When does words become to no profit, to subverting of the hearer, and they're striving about? We did studies on this, but ultimately, when does it become worthless? When this right here, brother, sister Christ, is taken out of the equation and you find yourself just bickering and you fall into arguments, you fall into debates, you fall into bickering, you fall into attacking people personally, drama, why does that all come in? Because this takes a sideline and it becomes about feelings and opinions, man's words, man's wisdom. When do we get away from that? When we open this and start hiding it in our hearts and living it. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. But let's keep reading here. Okay? Paul's saying the word of God is the final authority. Not the words of men. Okay? Not feelings and opinions. God's word. So verse 16. We read here, it says, But shame, profane, and vain babbling. Anything that's contrary to the scriptures where they're not used. Sometimes you can have two men that disagree that they're both trying to use Scripture, but which one's using it lawfully? Which one's a good steward of the Scriptures, and which one's trysting the Scriptures? That's a whole other situation, a whole other study. But the point of this is, is when you have someone who just completely goes away from the Bible, it's just words and opinions, oh, uh, Paul always named names, okay? Show me, every time Paul addresses and uses people as a bad example or a good example, he always names names, yes? We're going to find out. Okay? We're not going to babble. It's not going to be my feelings and opinions against their feelings and opinions. No. We're going to see what the scriptures have to say. But, so, but shun profane and vain babbling, for they will increase to more ungodliness. And he gives an example. But who's stop again? Who is he talking to? This letter is written to Timothy, a young man in ministry. Doctrinally, Timothy is addressed to young men in ministry. Instruction righteousness. Brethren, we can get a lot out of this for instruction and righteousness, but doctrinally, he's talking to a man in ministry. Paul is mentoring Timothy. There, this is important for this study. Okay, Sometimes we don't have to say that every time, but there's times where it is important for this study, it is. He's talking to Timothy. He says it will increase to more ungodliness, and then he gives an example. 17, and their word will eat at death a canker. Their word, their word, Remember we just read 15, Study shall thyself approved unto God, a workman that deed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, God's word. Now he says, And their word doth, e will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hermias and Philetus. Names. He's naming names, absolutely. But who's he naming names to? He's warning a man in ministry. Right? And Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already. And concerning the truth, they have erred. They had the truth at one time. They were preached the truth. They've turned against it. They've become part of the falling away. And overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I always got to throw that in there. Depart from it. Oh, zero. When you get saved, Jesus is okay with sin. Sin's not that big of a deal. He still has a zero tolerance for sin in our lives, brothers and sisters of Christ, as a saved sinner. Verse 20. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth and some of honor and some to dishonor. He names two people 
that have turned their back on the resurrection. He names them by name. See, that's only proven the problem. That Paul always named names. Paul always named names. Okay, who is this written to again? It's written to Timothy, a young man in ministry. And it's warning him not to make the mistake that these two men over here have made. Don't make the same mistake they did. Okay, they dropped from the faith. They stopped believing in God's word. How, do we see that happening today? Yes. Did Paul name names? Yes. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, 12. Let's see the effect. Remember where it said there that overthrowing the faith of some. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 2. First Corinthians 15, verse 12, I'm sorry, 15, 12. Here it is. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, talking about the resurrection, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Here it is again, the people that turn their back on the resurrection. It's already passed. There is no resurrection of the dead. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are all found false witness of God, because we have testified of God that he has risen up Christ, whom he raised us not up, if so be that the dead rise not. The dead, in general, rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised? And as Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. He's talking to a group of people that they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But he's not naming names. Okay. Over here, you have two people who believe the resurrection already passed. And then you have people here who don't believe in the resurrection at all. He's not naming names. He's generalizing a group of people. Some, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? Some? Oh, come on. Paul always names names. Where's the names, Paul? Uh, no, Paul didn't always name names. Okay? Some among you that there's no re resurrection of the dead. Paul didn't always name names. Okay? A good, another big example is 1 Corinthians 5 1. First Corinthians 5 1. Some of you, he didn't name names. He did when he talked to Timothy, but when he's addressing to the church as a whole, he didn't name names. But people always grab that when he's talking to Timothy, another brother in Christ, in ministry, that he's mentoring. He's saying, watch out for those guys. Watch out for these guys. He's training them up. Be, be, be careful. Okay? When it's the church as a whole, he used people as a bad example. Some of you say that there is no resurrection. Uh, where's the names? He didn't use names. 1 Corinthians 5.1 It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Who's the you? The church of Corinth as a whole. Remember, he didn't name names yet. And such fornication is it's not so much as named among the Gentiles that one, one of them, that I believe their name was well known, that one should have his father's wife. One. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he, singular, that hath done this deed, might be taken away from among you. Have we heard a name yet? No. Keep going. For I verily as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath done so done this deed. Some people, well, he didn't know the name. If it was the way he's talking about, it's published far out that they're fornicating hardcore at the church of Corinth. They're having problems, and some of them are going as far as to do this wicked deed. Uh, there are names, but Paul didn't name names. But he didn't name one name. You ready for it? Verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together in my spirit, 
with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the Spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He named Jesus Christ. We should never be ashamed to name the name Jesus Christ. As you see there, he didn't name names. Among you, one should have his father's wife. Ye are puffed up, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away. Where's the name? Paul always named names. This is a wicked sin. Paul always names names. He left it generalized, and basically he called them all out. Every one of them. Ones that were doing it to the ones that weren't doing it. He called them all out and said, listen, not that he said all of them were doing it, he just called them all out saying, this is wickedness, this is sin, it needs to be put away. Period. He used those people that were doing it as a bad example, but he generalized it. And it was serious. Very serious. 1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your glory is not good. The group as a whole, not everybody was glorifying it, but he just went ahead and lumped everybody together. He didn't name names. Your glory is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that he may be a new lump, the new man. And if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay? You're dead and buried. The old man's dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The, old man is, the new man is raised. And when the new man is raised, Paul warns about not resurrecting the old man. You let in a little leaven, you start letting sin back into your life, you start getting falling back into addictions, you start falling back into worldliness and doing things the world's way. Just a little bit, oh come on, just a little bit won't hurt. It'll destroy you. Look how messed up they got here in Corinth. Look how messed up, I, like I said, I believe the body of Christ today is really hurting. We're in the last days, and that fight to stay standing, that fight to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and looking for that blessed hope, there's very few of us that are still standing. I don't, just because someone's not standing, I don't believe they're false converts. I believe that, you know, there's a lot of us that are struggling with the world, worldliness, sin, and we need to get our hearts right with the Lord. He can come back any day now. You need to get your heart right, okay? That he may be a new lump, a new creature in Christ Jesus, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. <clears throat> so he goes into it, the death we, we die, we give our life to Jesus Christ at the cross, we die with him, and as he is raised from the dead, we are raised with him as a new creature. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's preaching sincerity and truth. But that doesn't mean you always have to name names. You can use people as a bad example without using names. Paul did. You can use people as bad examples and use their names and call their names out. Paul did. I think I might have taken it out, but when Paul heard about what, what uh, Peter was doing, did he go yell at everybody else? Or did he go withstood Peter to the face? He withstood Peter to his face. And he named him my name. And he named some other names. But he didn't name everybody. He named Barnabas. He named Peter. But he didn't name everybody. There was a lot more part of that whole group. Peter started it, though. Peter was the main problem. These two people we heard of, Hermetus and Philetus, they're the ones that say the resurrection's already passed, and if you can get them to stop believing in the resurrection in any way, shape, or form, you can get them in 1 Corinthians 15 to start denying the resurrection period. And that's what they were doing. Okay? There's a time to call out names, and there's a time not to call out names. Okay. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, The oven living bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote unto you an epistle not to come with fornicators, yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with the coaches, or with extortioners, or with idolaters. Be careful of brethren that get so covetous that they start their covetousness becomes idolatry, the Bible talks about. You say, give a good example. I'll use myself as an example. I live on the coast. But if God ever called me to live in an apartment in an ugly big city and there's a house church there and God says, that's where I want you, i got to be willing to give all this up to go where God wants me to go. But there's some, I could fall into the trap of coveting living on the coast and I don't want to give it up. And it's more important to me than the Word of God and God doing the work of God. My chickens. My dog. Some people might laugh at that, but when you're a single man living alone, your dog... 
He's your best friend, <laughs> you know? Especially since I don't have any brothers out here, brother, sister, Christ out here to fellowship with. My dog, the garden, okay, this property, okay? You start coveting things that are more important, your, the way you want to live your life, okay, it becomes idolatry. And when you see men that are, that are becoming very idolatry, becoming, falling for idolatry through their consciousness, not just necessarily they're worshiping false gods, obvious false gods, stay away from. These are supposed to be professing brethren that there's things in their life that are becoming lowercase g gods. For some brethren, their wives can become a lowercase g god. Their husbands can become a lowercase g god. Their children can become a lower. When you hold people above Jesus Christ, your walk with the Lord and His Word, it becomes covetousness, which is idolatry. Mm -hmm. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that be called a brother. Wait a minute. I've been told that Paul always names names. Paul, why don't you name names? Why don't you start pointing them out? See, this man, stay away from him. That man, stay away from him. That man's fornicator too. See that man, idolater. Stay away from him. If any man, kind of like if any man take the mark in the time of Jacob's trouble, you go to hell. That includes saved, saved or lost. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, he just generalizes it. If you find that he's a fornicator, or he's covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, sometimes you're falling. People railing, uh, getting into backbiting and whispering, you're, you're to break fellowship with them. If you find a group of people that like to do that a lot, they like to backbite, they like to whisper, railing, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, which such a one know not eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? God will judge them. Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judges. Okay, we show the lost world that they're sinners. That's as far as our judgment goes. We show them that they're sinners, they sin against God, and that they're on their way to hell. At that point, God will do it. Remember Paul says, I have planted, or no, yeah, I have planted, Apollos is watered, but God gives the increase. God's the one that's going to judge them. We preach truth to them, holding them accountable to the true plan of salvation, at that point God deals with them. You know what? That's how we're supposed to treat uh, brethren that fall away. We're supposed to put them without. Treat them like they're lost. Preach the gospel to them again. Say, listen, have you forgotten who it is you serve? Have you forgotten who it is you, who saved you? Have you forgotten the reason you needed to be saved? But he doesn't name names. Therefore, put away from among yourself that wicked person. He just says, hey, here's the truth. Now, start judging. He that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. That's why he said, if any man be called a brother. Well, nowadays with the false religions, I don't want to go too far off on this, but with the false Christian religions out there, if they're called a brother in Christ, they're supposed to get a free pass, right? No. If any man be called a brother, it doesn't matter. This is the foundation. Someone comes up to you and says, Paul always named names. If I show you one time where he didn't, and I just showed you several times that he didn't, and we're going to keep going. Turn to Galatians 2.7. We're going to show some times where he... I guess I'm doing both. There's times where he named names. Absolutely. But don't be deceived by those that only grab where he named names and say, see, Paul always named names. Watch out for those people. Okay? Please, watch out for those people. Paul did not always name names. But he did sometimes. Galatians 2.7. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he thought, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me towards the Gentiles. So you have Paul, it's talking about him, and Peter. There's names. See, Paul names names. I'm not denying that. Please understand, I'm not denying that. Paul named names. But what I'm saying is, be careful when someone decides that they decide Paul always named names. Is that truth? Or is that a lie? 
Is that truth or is that heresy? Verse 9, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, Paul named names again, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they into the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But, I did put this in the notes, but when Peter was come to Antioch, he names Peter. I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. And I really want to point this out here. He withstood him to the face. He didn't go behind Peter's back and start backbiting and whispering and, and he's wrong here and he shouldn't be doing it. Brothers, it's Christ. You need to check yourself. If you believe I'm wrong, you come talk to me in my face. If you believe another brother in Christ is wrong, somebody who's not even in ministry, if you believe a brother in Christ is wrong, he's in sin, he's doing wickedness, you don't talk about him behind his back. You withstand him to his face. Do, and remember what we talked about in meekness, though. I might not be raising my voice because I do get frustrated because I've had brethren that will talk about me behind my back. And it does get frustrating. But they won't talk to me to my face. Okay? They've been caught back. I've had uh, a mentor that was caught backbiting and whispering in emails behind my back. To my face, he's patting me on the back saying, Good work, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. Keep up the good work. I learned from this study. You're doing great, brother. I'm praying for you, brother. I love you, brother. Yet behind my back, he's, he's, he's singing a different tune. Okay? You got a problem with somebody, a brother in Christ, but says, Christ, go withstand them to their face. But remember what we did in our study. Sometimes you have to stop, take a step back, you have to take a deep breath and go, I need to calm down. Because the Bible says in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Okay, when Peter was, uh, when Paul withstood Peter to his face, Paul wasn't a jerk. Paul wasn't just a man that was just losing his temper, name calling, mocking, backbiting, whisper. No. And meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. You can still speak with authority and have meekness. You can have both. Just don't be a jerk. Verse 11, but when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. Okay, salvation has gone to the Gentiles. This isn't a culture thing. Please, brothers of Christ, don't fall for that lie. This has nothing to do with culture, uh, um, Gentile culture, and Jewish culture. Don't believe that lie. It has to do with salvation. He did eat with the Gentiles. Okay? In the Old Testament, I'll go through it again. In the Old Testament, in order for a Gentile to hang out with a Jew, they had to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. They had to be adopted into the Jewish people. Or the Jews weren't allowed to fellowship with them. And you can read the whole story about how Peter was like, I've never eaten anything unclean. And then all the animals come down, and God says, rise and eat, Peter. What I have made clean, called out not common, to let them know that salvation has gone to the Jewish people, I mean, to the Gentiles. The Jews can fellowship with the Gentiles that are saved. They're now made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is a salvation issue, not a culture issue. Okay? I'm sorry, I just I get frustrated because some brethren will destroy this passage and turn it into a culture issue because they're so busy, they're so addicted to culture, trying to judge if justify worldliness, wickedness, and sin. Okay. For before certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. He treated them like a brother in Christ. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision, physical circumcision. And he treated the Gentiles as if they weren't saved, they weren't brethren. They're heathens, they're lost. And the other Jews, other Jews, we just saw names. He named Peter, and he named James. When James comes, the other Jews come. He sets with the Jews and treats the Gentiles as if they're lost. When those Jews leave, Peter goes and hangs out with the Gentiles. Okay, now you're brothers in Christ again. But now you're lost. But now you're brothers in Christ again. Okay, how many of you have seen people fall in the trap of that? My Lord, KG, God said to stay away from you. 
But when he's not around, I'll hang out with you. But when he comes around, i got to back off and act like I have nothing to do with you. Oh boy. I've seen that happen in the body of Christ. People start forming their own cliques and their own groups. And when their groups aren't around, then they'll be friends with you. But when their groups are around, they back off and act like you don't exist. Right? We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. We all need to be treated that way. Right? But when they were come, he withdrew, separated himself, fearing them which were the circumcision. And the other Jews, other Jews, no names, dissembled likewise with him. He just grouped them up in a group. All you have to do is find one time where he didn't name names. We've found lots of times where Paul didn't always name names. But there are times when he did name names. Peter started it and he named his name and said, I had to withstand him to his face. This is the book of Galatians where they were trying to go back under the Levitical laws. And under the Levitical laws, Peter was not allowed to fellowship and hang out with Gentiles that aren't circumcised and aren't keeping the laws of Moses. That was what this book's about. It's not about culture. Don't fall for that lie. Okay? It's about salvation. Are you under the Old Testament? Or are you under the New Testament? Paul kept, or Peter kept bouncing back and forth. The other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas, he, he does use a name, Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all, If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of the Gentiles, in other words, you're not keeping the law, to be saved. And not as the Jews. Why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? Trying to bring them back under the law. I'm sorry, but you really destroy it. You really, it's like, I've heard a brother in Christ say that the Holy Day, Sabbath Day, and New Moon, only the Jews have a Sabbath Day. So he, first he started out by saying it was uh, Gentile culture in uh, Colossians chapter 2. And then he tries to correct himself and he throws the Jews in there because only Jews have Sabbath days. And honestly, only holy days and Sabbath days okay, are the Jews. But you can't argue the Sabbath day. That's a Jewish thing. And he says, oh, it's just Jewish uh, uh, culture. No, it is not. It's a command of God to his chosen people, Jacob, which becomes Israel. The name is no longer Jacob, but Israel. It's God's chosen people, and they are under His commands. And one of His commands to His people is to keep the Sabbath day. Culture just means traditions of men. It's a choice, and they can. No, it wasn't in the Old Testament. It was a command, and there was consequences for not keeping the Sabbath day. You can't get around this, brothers. Some brethren do. Be careful of good words and fair speeches. This is talking about Old Testament. Being brought, Paul started acting like he's under the Old Testament when the Jews came around. And when the Jews left, he would live as the, with the Gentiles like he's under the New Testament, where your salvation is based off of Jesus Christ and his blood that was shed. Not circumcision, not keeping the laws. Verse 15, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentile, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Right there, just proved what I was saying. Anybody says any differently, they got a problem with Scripture. Not with me. Anybody that says it's culture thing has a problem with Scripture. Not with me. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. In other words, they don't have to be circumcised and keep the laws of Moses, the Levitical laws, touch not, taste not, eat not, holy days, Sabbath days, new moon, those are all nailed to the cross. Right? The, the Gentiles, you can fellowship with Gentiles. They're saved. They don't have to keep the law in order to fellowship with them. But by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Let that sink in. <laughs> Peter's like, I'm going to hang out with the Jews that, that, that are circumcised and keep the laws of Moses. Yet, Peter, you're not keeping the laws of Moses. You're a failure. You're an utter failure. That's why you needed Jesus Christ. 
For the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if we, but if, while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are also found sinners. Peter has to be reminded, when you came to the cross, you realized, I failed the law. I couldn't keep the law. The law is our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Jesus is the answer. Okay. Not circumcision in the law. As therefore Christ the minister of sin, God forbid, but if I build again the, the if I build again the things which I destroyed, in other words, I destroyed the fact that I'm not going through the Old Testament. Remember, the old, we read this in Colossians chapter 2, how the laws, the Levitical laws, uh, physical circumcision was nailed to the cross, destroying the law of sin and death. Because Jesus fulfilled it. He paid the price. You can go through Jesus Christ, or you can go through the Levitical laws that lead to the law of sin and death. Hell. Okay? Paul, Peter, you went to the cross. You nailed that to the cross, and it was destroyed. It's the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses you from all unrighteousness. We used to do a study on this. It's Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? No man comes to the Father but through him. There's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We don't go through the Levitical laws anymore. We go through Jesus Christ. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Paul was acting like a tra Peter was acting like a transgressor. But look at what's going on here. He named Peter. He named James. Then he said Gentiles. He didn't name the people that Peter and them were, were withdrawing from and then going and hanging out. He just generalized them. Gentiles, other Jews, and Barnabas. But he didn't name names. Peter, James, Barnabas. There are times where he names names. And there's times where he doesn't name names. Paul, or, yeah, Paul did not always name names. 2 Timothy 4.8. Turn to 2 Timothy 4.8. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and not me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. He didn't name names. All them that love his appearing. Brothers says Christ, do you love are you still looking for that blessed hope? Present tense? Do you love the appearing of Jesus Christ that you're living every day like Jesus Christ could come back today? Or if you've fallen into the trap like some of the brethren have and they've turned their back on it? Oh, Jesus isn't coming back today. Oh, Jesus isn't coming back for another four or five years. I can't really see how Jesus could come back today. They're trying to play God. And they've turned their back on it. Don't let anybody steal your crown, brother, says Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Looking for that blessed hope every day with the life that you live. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. And here we get some more names. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and departed unto Thessalonica. You know the number one reason that brethren break up? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. We have disagreements in the Bible, yes. And you have some brethren that, you know, they get prideful. And they get stubborn. But ultimately what I see is the number one reason that brethren break fellowship is what you read right here. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto, departed unto Thessalonica. Anyone know why he went to Thessalonica? Let's see if I can skip ahead. Because when you get to Acts 7.10, we're going to read it again later, it says, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These Bereans were more noble than, the, than those in Thessalonica. What did we just read here? Demas hath forsaken, having loved this present world, departed unto Thessalonica. Why did, he, why did he go to Thessalonica? Let's keep reading in Acts 17, 11, which we'll turn to again later. Uh, Thessalonica, and that they received the word with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were sold. In other words, the Thessalonica as a whole were searching the scriptures to see if those things were so. This isn't the final authority for the Thess Thessalonians. It's the words of men. Here you have Demas that's forsaken me, having loved this present world, and departed unto Thessalonica. 
I know brethren who've done that. Worldliness comes in, sin comes in, and they love their worldliness, they love their sin, they want to keep it, and we get to argue over the scriptures because I'm like a Berean, and they're like a Thessalonican. They don't want this to be the final authority. Stop quoting the scriptures. Stop quoting scriptures at me. I said, oops, because I wrote this a little bit. Stop quoting uh, scriptures at me. I'm my own final authority. Feelings and opinions are the final authority. Culture, heritage, traditions of men are the final authority. You're going to have those brothers of Christ. I'm telling you, any time that I've actually hardcore disagreed with someone I believe is truly saved, even to this day, that I believe they're truly saved and born again, this is why. Having loved this present world, men that put their wives first, sisters in Christ that put their husbands first, that put their children first, that put their way of living first, worldly things first, physical things first, above the Word of God. And you call them out for that, and you end up losing fellowship. Either they get back on the right path, or you end up losing fellowship. Why? Because they had loved this present world, and they prefer to be like a Thessalonican than a Berean. Paul calls them out by name. All right. Haven't left me. But who's he writing to again? He's writing to a brother in Christ, one-on-one. -on -one. It's a one-on-one -on -one letter. We get this letter and we get to use it. It's part of God's Word. It's part of Scripture. But he's writing and he's talking to a brother one-on-one. -on -one. He's not out there just using people's names left and right for everything. When it comes to preaching to a group as a whole, he tends to, when you listen to Paul, he tends to use people as a bad example, but he doesn't call them out by name. When he's talking one-on-one -on -one or with a group of believers that's in ministry, he'll call them out by name. Hey, watch out for that guy. Watch out for this guy. But when it comes to brethren as a whole, he generalizes. Hmm. Cretans to Galatia. Now, Cretans to Galatia doesn't mean Cretans bad. Some people always try to add and say, well, Cretans fallen away like Demas. No, it's, it actually said, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world and departed into Thessalonica. Now he's saying Cretans is in ministry over in Galatia. Okay, Titus unto Dalmatia. So Titus is over there in Dalmatia doing... God's work, okay? Preaching the word and living for the Lord, doing God's work over there. Verse 11, only Luke is with me. Now, he's talking about physically. Now, I used to use this verse wrongly because I started parroting what someone else said. So he says here, only Luke is with me. Everyone's forsaken Paul and it's just Luke. He's the only one there. That's not what this is saying. One man forsook him. The others are doing ministry elsewhere. I mean, Timothy's not even there. Is Timothy falling away? Everyone's forsaken Paul, even Timothy. No. Timothy's somewhere else doing the work of the Lord, and Paul's like, I need your help. I need you to come to me. And we're going to read that here. It says, only Luke is with me. Physically, it's talking about physically. Luke is the only one that's here doing the ministry with me. So there's two men doing ministry. That should be a sign, brother, says Christ, more than anything, not a sign, but a fact of the Bible that when it comes to ministry, I hate being a one-man show. I don't want to be a one-man show. We're not supposed to be a one-man show. You're supposed to be in ministry with other men. That helps us stay accountable. That keeps us from being above accountability. It helps keep the pride and ego down. When you're held accountable one to another, other men in ministry. I'm telling you, I don't want to be in ministry of one. I don't want my pride and ego to go through the roof. I could name names of brethren who become a one-man show. And their egos and their pride is through the roof. Okay. Uh, it's very important. We're not supposed to be a one-man show, but that's another study. It says here, take Mark. Mark saved. He hasn't fallen away. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. We need men in ministry, and we need to be working together. The Bible says we're to strive together. We're all supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment. We're supposed to be striving together. So what's this big push online for everyone to have their own separate online ministry or, you know, battle buildings that are one-man shows? It's not supposed to be that way. It wasn't that way with Paul. Kind of getting into another study I want to do about Paul, you know. What was Paul's heartfelt desire? 
His number one heartfelt desire was face-to-face -face fellowship, not letters. They didn't have online back then, but not online. Face-to-face -face fellowship, doing the work, hands-on ministry work with other men in ministry. His desire was not to be a one-man show. There was times where he was waiting. Remember the one time in the Bible where he was sitting there waiting? I forgot where he was, but he saw that altar to the unknown God and it just vexed him to the point where he started preaching. But if you read, he didn't go there by himself intending to preach one man show. No, he went there and he sat there and he was waiting for other men in ministry to come with him so they could start preaching together. Because the Bible says before two or three witnesses, let every word be established. You're not supposed to be a one man show. There's supposed to be two or more of you preaching. Okay? And you're supposed to line up. Be of the same mind and the same judgment. I just want to throw that in there. To take Mark and bring him with thee, for he's profitably in the ministry. And Tychus have I sent to Ephesus. He sent a man to Ephesus to work with some of the men there in ministry. Okay? The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, another man in ministry, when thou comest, bring, the, bring with thee in the books, but especially the parchments. He's saying, bring, these are men of ministry, and this is kind of, he's given Timothy an idea of how the ministry is going, where everybody is. Okay? Just because he says only Luke is with me, he's talking about physically. Spiritually, there's still other men in ministry that were all part of the same ministry, but they're spread out. Some are here, some are there, some Luke is with me, I need you to come, I need you to take Mark, and you come with me. So now it's going to be Luke, Paul, Mark, and Timothy, so there will be four of them, because the area we're going to go preach to, we need at least two people, before two or three witnesses, let every word be established, there's two of us we're going to be preaching, but I need four. These people, whatever Paul was trying to do, it must have been hard. And he wanted help. He really wanted some help. Might have even needed some help. And this is where we get to 2 Timothy 4.14, where it says, Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. He's talking about ministry. He's telling P Timothy, watch out for that man, Alexander the coppersmith. Did he name names? Absolutely. Did he always name names? No. But did he name names sometimes? Absolutely. We need to have a little, even I need to start having a little bit more courage in naming some names sometimes. I'd rather just generalize it all for the most part and hope and pray that that person that really put me on to that study because they're wrong will, you know, be convicted and repent. But there are times where I need to work on naming names more, but there are some people who need to work on generalizing more. You don't always have to name names. Okay? Paul didn't always name names. But this is where you get Alexander the Cosmist, did him much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. Of whom be thou where also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. Of whom thou where also. He's warning a man in ministry. But he's not writing to the Corinthians and saying, stay away from this man. He's not writing to uh, the Galatians, the Ephesians. Okay, this is a man in ministry. Warning him that, hey, this guy is trying to attack men in ministry and keep us from doing the work of the Lord. Here is 2 Timothy 4.16. At first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. There's times, I believe, in Paul's life where a lot of men that were physically present with him, not all brethren across the board, the men that were physically present with him forsook him, and he was alone. There's a lot of times where he was alone, physically. They were stretched out so thin, he was alone. But it says here, at first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. But he doesn't, does it, he didn't name all the men. He named one of them. We just read his name, Demas, hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he went to Thessalonica, where they don't hold the word of God as the final authority. They have a hard time holding the word of God. Some of them probably do, but as a majority, as a group, as a whole, they, don't, they take men's words over the word of God. They're not checking the word of God, which is why they're easier to, to be deceived. Demas have forsaken me, having loved this present world, and he went to a group of people that are easier to be deceived because they're not going off the scriptures. And we see that in the world today. All these different religious groups out there, these cults and Bible buildings, cult of personality and everything, they, they, they strive on people that don't want to be Bible believers. There's very few Bible believers left today. 
that this is the final authority. It's that man behind the pulpit. It's that man behind the camera. They become lowercase g gods. But I don't want to go too much into that. But that's Demas. But all men forsook me. There was a time where a, a huge group of men forsook Paul. But he didn't name all. Uh, yeah, Paul. He didn't name all of them. Did Timothy? He named one, but he didn't name them all. He just named one. I pray God that it may that it may not be laid to their charge. Seventeen. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Brothers, brothers in Christ that are in ministry, there's times where you're going to feel like you're all alone. There is. I do. Like I said, I, I, I was just mentioning Victoria be, could become a lowercase g God idolatry if I start putting her above the Word of God. You, you get to being so lonely, you get so used to the things you have around here, you, the safety net of I'm used to here, that thought of having to move somewhere else, pack up. I'd end up selling like 90% of my stuff if I ever had, if I if God ever said, hey, here's a house church over here I want you to be a part of, move. I'm not taking all this stuff with me. Just mainly this room, a lot of the books and the computer uh, where I do the work and everything. Uh, but a lot of the stuff in the house, it just gets sold. Whatever can be fit in the truck, in the back, the back of my truck, that's it. But the Lord stands with me. There's times I do feel alone, brother says Christ, and I know that brother says Christ that you feel alone sometimes. Right? But brethren in ministry, there are times where it feels like you're, like I do sometimes. I'm just, I'm a whisper. I tell people I feel like sometimes I'm in an ocean, a vast ocean, and I'm floating there, and I'm screaming out at the top of my lungs and looking around, and there's nobody for thousands of miles. I use that as an example of me being a brother in Christ trying to preach the Word of God to other brethren in the world. Sometimes I feel like, is there anyone around listening? And then sometimes you guys show me, yeah, I'm here. You make great comments in the comment sections when it ha uh, you know, having to do with the study that we're doing. And I'm like, okay, they were listening. Okay, they, it actually reached somebody. Uh, I look at 7 billion people in the world, the gospel, and I look at maybe t uh, my videos... 10 people, I think when I looked at the analytics on YouTube, I think it was like 10 people to 20 people are watching my studies all the way through. If the analytics are true. 10 to 20 people out of 7 billion people. Like I said, I feel like I'm floating in that ocean and there's nobody for thousands of miles around and I'm screaming with the top of my lungs trying to preach the Word of God, but is there anybody hearing it? Okay. But I'm not alone. Brothers in Christ that are in ministry, you're not alone. You're not supposed to be a ministry of one. You're not supposed to be pushing a ministry of one. Sometimes you happen to be a ministry of one because you're the only one in the area. I'm the only one in this area. I understand that. But there are some brethren that are pushing separation from the body of Christ that we're, all, that we're supposed to be alone. No, it's something that, that's going to happen. But you're not supposed to desire it and you're not supposed to make it happen. You're supposed to desire fellowship with brethren. You're supposed to desire to be in ministry with other brethren. But there will be time where you will be alone. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. I might feel like I'm hardly reaching anybody. But maybe my video's getting re-uploaded somewhere else and now we're getting thousands of views. Or it gets reviewed, list over here, over here, just because my, you know, my videos are lucky to get 100 200 views, and I'm not about views. Views don't mean squat. Maybe someday I'll do a video showing the analytics, but the views don't mean squat. I look on there, out of if I'm blessed to get 100 views, maybe 10 out of every 100 views watch the video all the way through. That I might have reached 10 brethren with truth and encouraged you to live a life of Christ and to keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Right? That the preaching might be fully known, but if I've reached one person then you can take that and pass it on to somebody else. But this is Christ. And you can pass on that teaching. That person can pass. It can slowly go around through one person. It doesn't have to be thousands of views. Don't get so... Don't get so I know a brother in Christ that gets so uh, over out of control with views. This person has so many views and has so many subscriptions and this, and now he's becoming about subscriptions. Subscribe, subscribe. Make sure you hit that like button. Don't be overcome by that. That doesn't mean anything. What matters is when you reach one person minimum. 
a brother or sister in Christ for the truth, and it's helped them to, with their walk with the Lord. And I'm talking to other brethren in ministry. Don't get discouraged. In these last days, we're not going to have thousands of views. We're not going to have thousands of subscriptions. And that's not the foundation of, of whether our work is, means anything and is, and is doing anything. What matters is that it's known by the brethren and you're reaching at least one person for the truth. You can preach the gospel. Let's say, like I said, there's 7 billion people. I know I'm going off on a little bit of a rabbit trail. 7 billion people. Let's say you, this is just, you know, never would never happen. But I preach the gospel to all 7 billion people and one person got saved. It was worth it. It was worth it. I preach the God, I preach truth to brethren like this video, what I'm doing with this video, and one person takes it to heart and starts living it. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Every evil work he delivered him out of the coppersmith, Alex the coppersmith's hands. Every evil work and will preserve me into his heavenly kingdom to whom glory be forever and ever. Amen. Salute Priscilla or Precia and Aquila. Precia and Aquila. And the household of Oniphorus. Aristus abode at Corinth, but Trophimus have I left at Milton sick. There's another man he had to leave behind because he was sick, but we had to continue doing the work of the Lord, but he was very sick. We left him behind. Physically, not spiritually, praying for him, but physically. Once again, this is also a sign that uh, Paul could no longer heal anybody. Healing, working of miracles, and some uh, is and the gifts of healing when it comes to where they kind of go hand in hand with working of miracles. The sign gifts are gone. Paul can't heal anymore. He couldn't heal this man and say, "Okay, I'm healing you, and we're going to continue the ministry." He couldn't do it. He had to leave him behind. Verse 21, do thy diligence to come before winter. Iwilus greeteth thee, and Pudens, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. There's other brethren there. He didn't name them, but he names a lot of them, but not all of them. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. Amen. Did Paul, going back, to, I didn't mean to go off on a tangent too much, but going back to Paul. Did Paul name names? Yes. Did Paul always name names. Paul always names names. No. Paul didn't. What about Jesus? This kind of got put in last minute when I was putting together the study. Did Jesus always name names? We say, why are you bringing up Jesus? They didn't say Jesus always named names. They say Paul always named names. But remember what Paul said. You don't have to turn here, but first turn to Matthew 21-23. But right here, first, I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 4.15 says, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the word, wherefore I beseech you, be ye fathers, followers of me. This is Paul. You, go to, you don't have to, but 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, it says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances of, as I have delivered them to you. But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. But I would have you know the. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, but be followers of me as I am of Christ. When you're saying uh, Paul always named names. Inadvertently, what you're also saying is, is Jesus always named names. I'm going to give you a great, uh, we're going to read the long passage, Matthew 21, and we're going to show that Jesus didn't always name names. He, 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 he singled out people, and people will say, well, it's because they, he feared for his life or something. Well, no, he says, time has not yet come. He could blind him and disappear. He did that before. The group wanted to take him and stone him to death. So he blind he he did, he did he didn't blind him. But what he did was is he made himself kind of where they forgot where he was and he made his way through him and, and kept going. And they're like, where did he go? Where did he go? I, we're gonna stone him. Where did he go? So his time has not yet come. So when he's not using names, it's not because he fears the people. Don't use that as excuse. Okay. 
He didn't use names because there's times where he called out the Pharisees. But who did he call out the Pharisees? Who did he say, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? He was talking to his disciples. But when he's preaching to the world, the Jews as a whole, he's speaking to them in what? Parables. And there's some we're going to read right here, a parable where he's reading a parable attacking the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. But he doesn't call them out by name. Let's go through this. Because I want you to take my word for it. What saith the scriptures? Matthew 21, 23. And when he was coming to the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came unto him as he was teaching, he was teaching the people as a whole, and said, By what authority doest thou these things? And who gave thee this authority? And Jesus answered and said unto them, I also will ask you one thing, which if ye tell me, I and likewise shall tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, whence was it? From, from heaven or of men? And they reasoned with themselves, saying, If we shall say from heaven, he will say unto us, Why did, he, why did ye not then believe him? And that's a good thing. Why didn't you believe him? But that's what I kind of, real quick side. So many people claim to be Bible believers. But when you ask them, What saith the scriptures? They go crazy with why then you find out they're not Bible believers. Well, if we say that that's not true, what are they saying right now? Not trying to go off too much, but uh, Romans road to hell. No, it's the Romans road to heaven. It's Romans road to find God's grace. But now they're trying to say it's the Romans road to hell. They don't believe it. Why did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, we fear the people, for all hold John as a prophet. So they didn't believe John. And they feared the people. That's basically what's going on. They didn't believe John was a prophet. They didn't believe what he said. But they fear the people. They don't profess that out loud because they fear the people being stoned to death. Verse 27. And they answered Jesus and said, We cannot tell. And he said unto them, Neither tell I you by what authority I do these things. Now remember the people, the priests, the chief priests and the elders of the people, and then somehow the... Um, Pharisees get brought in too. He starts to go into a, par uh, a parable. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterwards, he repented. He had sorrow for telling his father no. It was a sin. And he turned from that sin, and what does he do? And he went. And he went and did the work he was, he was told to do. Verse 30. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. That's your Sadducees, your scribes, and your Pharisees. Okay. Verse 31. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, they say unto him, the first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. The ones that said, I don't want any part in this. But later they repent and say, I need to fall on my knees before the Lord. Remember, this is Old Testament. Okay. Verse 32. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him. And ye, when, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterwards that ye might believe him. Hear another parable. There was a certain householder which planted a vineyard and held it round about and digged a wine press in it and built a tower and let out and let it out to husbandmen. He's talking about the Pharisees, Sadducees, and scribes, the religious leaders of that day. He let it and went into a far country. And when the time when the fruit drew near, he sent his servant to the husbandmen that they might receive the fruits of it. The Bible talks about how the Old Testament prophets would come and witness. And prophesy God's word to the people and the religious leaders of the day. And the kings would kill them, throw them into prison, beat them, throw them away. That's what this is talking about. Verse 35. And the husbandman took his servants and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other servants more than the first, and they did unto him likewise. But last of all, he sent unto him his son, God, 
Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, the Son of God, saying, They will reverence my Son. But when the husbands saw the Son, they said among themselves, This is the heir, come let us kill him. And they did. They took him before Pontius Pilate. We have no king but Caesar. They rejected God as their king for the um, second time. First time's Old Testament, when they very first asked for a man as king, when Saul became king, is because they rejected God as king. Then they rejected Jesus as king right here, and then they rejected Jesus as their king again in the book of Acts, the transition book. Okay? And then God put off the kingdom, the day of the Lord, whole other study, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ got put off until after the day of the Gentiles is fulfilled. Okay, what we call the church age. Let us kill him and let us seize on his inheritance. If we get rid of this Jesus, then we can go back to being in charge and we can be the masters like Thessalonica. Man's wisdom, man's words will be the final authority. Not God's word. Brian's, God's word. Thessalonica, man's words. Let us seize on inheritance. And they caught him and cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. When the Lord therefore of the vineyard cometh, what will he do to those husbandmen? And they said unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Okay? Depart from me into everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels that never knew you. And will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their season. Salvation is gone to the Gentiles. We are now all part of the priesthood. Not just the Levites. Not just those religious leaders which were predominantly Levites. Okay. Jesus say, saith unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and is, a marvelous, is, it, and is it marvelous in, your, in our eyes? Therefore say I unto you, The kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Verse 45. And when the chief priests and Pharisees had heard his parable, they perceived that he spake of them. But did he name them by name? No. No, he didn't. But when they sought to lay hands on him, they feared the multitude because they took him for a prophet. Brother and sister Christ, Paul did not always name names. Jesus didn't always name names. There are times you spiritual discernment, brother and sister Christ, you spiritual discernment. There are going to be times where you're going to name names, and there's going to be times where you're not going to name names, and you're going to use someone as a bad example without naming names, and sometimes you're going to use someone as a exa bad example, and you're going to name names. You're going to use people as a good example and name names. There's times where you're going to use people as a good example and not name names. Give me just a second. Sorry about that. <laughs> Victoria needed to go out my dog. Um, Brother says Christ, there's a time where Paul used names. Good examples, he used names. Good examples, he spoke to him in general. There's times where he uses bad, there's him as a bad example where he just says names or he uses, talks about them in general. Okay. Remember, there's a time to name names, there's a time not to name names. Use spiritual discernment. Okay. Uh, what I'm getting from some people that say that these people are cowards because they won't name names. When I'm doing a teaching and it pricks someone's heart, convicts them, okay, that's what it's supposed to do. Just like when I watch studies from Peter Ruckman, old studies, I still watch old studies from when it was King James Video Ministries. Brother Brian, back when it was King James Video Ministries, and this was the final authority, not culture, um, I got convicted. When he preached, it was like he was talking to me and talking about me. But he had no clue about my sins. He had no clue about what I was going on, going on with in my life. Same thing with Peter Ruckman. Same with all the other brethren out there that are preaching. When we preach a preaching and it convicts someone's heart, uh, there's a reason for that. It's a good thing. Get your heart right with the Lord. Make sure you line up with the scriptures. But beware of some brethren that have a, what is it called, a persecution complex. Everyone's always talking about them, and it's always about them. Be careful of those people. Okay? 
I see that comes, it seems to go hand in hand with brethren. And I'm, I'm only talking and addressing brethren because they're the ones that care about. The lost world, they need Jesus Christ. They need to get saved. Okay? But the brethren, because um, I do care about the lost world but when it comes to salvation, but preaching truth, the lost world doesn't care about the truth. This is to brethren. Okay? When I see brethren that start falling into a persecution complex, it's because pride starts getting up. Pride and envy. They start having a problem with that. And then they start, get, they start developing a persecution pro, uh, complex. They didn't use my name, but I know they're talking about me. Well, if they're talking about uh, drunkenness, are you, drunk, are you getting drunk sometimes? Well, well, then you're supposed to be. Then they are talking about you, just not invertly, directly about you, and so forth. Are they preaching against this sin? Are they preaching against covetousness, which is idolatry? Are they preaching... Whatever... It's going to convict you of your sin. But be careful, okay, with the persecution complex. I watched it, and I'm passing on a testimony from Peter Ruckman. I was watching, listening more than anything, because a lot of his old studies are on tape, and they've been put online. Uh, an old teaching where he stops for a second, kind of almost like he's going off on a rabbit trail, but he's talking about persecution, and he talks about how he hasn't really known persecution. This is a man that he gets attacked all the time. He gets name-called all the time. He's got books written against him. He's got, you know, it's like the equivalent of today, me saying, I've got videos. i got videos of men attacking me personally. Okay, they, they make videos against me. I have enemies. Uh, Peter Ruppin always said he likes it that way. He likes to have his friends here and his enemies here. He's got enough friends to keep him company and enough enemies to keep him awake. But when it comes to true persecution, he'd always talk about how he doesn't really know much about true persecution. And he would talk about the stories of Christians in the past on how they actually went through persecution. Yes, it breaks my heart. If you lost a family member that won't talk to you anymore, yeah, you're being persecuted for Jesus Christ, I understand. But that's not even, a, that's not even on the level of the persecution that brother had to face. Even the ones we're reading here, what Paul went through, being beaten... Uh, thrown in prison, thrown in chains, being beheaded, tortured. And Peter Ruckman told the story, he told it like a child, like a man that was preaching the word of God. He told a story about the child. I don't know if it was a true story or, or he was using it as an example of what he feels it's true persecution, that he always compares his persecution to this. Has he actually lived this yet? And that man's daughter is in the kitchen with the stove, and they're pressing her face to the stove, burning her, and she's screaming, Daddy, help me! Daddy, help me! Help me! And they're looking at the man saying, Are you going uh, to give us your King James Bibles? Are you going to promise not to preach the Word? Are you going to promise not to preach the Gospel? That's persecution! Don't get me wrong, if you have a family member turn their back on you, that's persecution too, but that level of persecution... Peter Ruckman's like, I really haven't really faced hardcore persecution. Don't know what it is. I've never had to face it. I have knowledge. He reads about people who were hardcore persecuted. But in his life personally, right, be careful these people that act like they're just so persecuted. They don't know what persecution is yet. I pray they never do. Real persecution, like hardcore persecution. Yes, you're going to have family members turn on you when you get saved and you start living the life of Christ. Yes, you're going to have family write you off. You might end up losing your job and having to work harder, twice as hard for less pay somewhere else because you got saved and they didn't like the man you are. You might suffer some persecution, but there's some brethren out there that they I, I can't even speak to their level of persecution of what they went through. I've read books. I've got um, Fox's Book of Martyrs. Um, there was another book written by a Jew where he talks about, um, and I have it over there somewhere, Tortured, uh, David Ben Lu, I think it is. Let's see if I can read it. Tortured for Christ. No, Richard Warmbrandt. Tortured for Christ. You listen to some of their stories, and it's like, it shuts me up. You'll never see me sit here acting like I have such a persecution complex. I'm so persecuted. Who no. Okay. Someone who has that attitude that you're always, everybody's always talking about me. 
Okay, be very careful, brothers and Christ. Don't fall into a persecution complex. I recommend that book, Fox's Book of Martyrs and Tortured for Jesus Christ. You want to know what true persecution is? That's a good one. Uh, Flames in the Wind. Uh, Christians are being persecuted and tortured and then burnt at the stake. And they get humiliated as they're on their way out to the stake and then burnt at the stake and all these people around just spitting on them. It almost reminds me, it's not even close, but it reminds me a little bit of what Jesus Christ went through when he had to carry the cross. I mean, all they're ripping his beard out. They've beaten him beyond recognition within an inch of his life. They've whipped him within an inch of his life. They've ripped his beard out. They're spitting on him. They're yelling at him. These people that one, one moment, they're laying olive branches down. Jesus is walking through and it's, praise the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. So they love you. They love you. So they hate you. And they're cursing you. And they're spitting at you. If you ever think that your persecution is just, oh, it's just, I am so pers I'm the most persecuted, just a high persecution complex, remember what Jesus Christ went through. Remember what the apostles went through. Remember what brethren went through in the past. Today, we don't know persecution. Drop your pride. Drop your ego. Okay? Drop the persecution complex. I've got videos made against me. I've got people that call me names. I've had brethren turn on me. Bear false witness, back, promoting backbiting and whispering. Okay? I, I suffer loneliness because of it, because I've had brethren turn my back on me simply because another brother in Christ said, stay away from that man, he'll mess you up. And, and they're like, okay. Well, why? Just because I said so. Okay. And I've lost fellowship with brethren that I love and care about. Okay? Be careful of a, a, a persecution complex. When someone gets to the point where they have to lie about Scripture and say, Paul always named names, be careful about that. Sometimes it's just someone parroting PWCing what some other man taught, and they're just teaching what somebody other, some other man taught. You know, kind of like Jesus. Jesus, um, what was one of those teachings that I debunked? Uh, Jesus mocked people in his earthly ministry. Jesus mocked people, and I proved that Jesus is God, and he had the authority to mock people, but in his earthly ministries, that parable wasn't mocking. That parable was calling them out to the, to the people. But the only people that were supposed to get it was who? The apostles, his disciples. To them it's given to know the truth, but to the world, parables. They weren't, uh, they weren't supposed to understand. Only the disciples were. Okay? And later on, us, we can read that and understand who he's talking about. But be careful of not being a PWC. Paul, or Jesus mocked, I, I challenge that. Over in the Old Testament, we went to um, Elisha. Eli, there's Elijah and Elisha. Elijah, he is mocking the priests of Baal. And I give the Bible definition of what mocking is. And I said, show me where Jesus Christ is doing that in his earthly ministry. Show me where Paul's doing that. They aren't. They're not. Jesus did not mock in his earthly ministry. He has the authority to mock in the Old Testament. It talks about how God will mock them and have them derision in the time of Jacob's trouble. Absolutely. Because God has the authority to mock. It wasn't Elijah. Uh, yeah, Elijah. Because I keep getting mixed up between Elijah and Elisha. Elijah wasn't mocking the priest of Baal. It was God uh, mocking the priest of Baal through, in front of the people through Elijah. Elijah had the Holy Spirit in him. Not everybody had the Holy Spirit in him in the Old Testament. Elijah did. He spoke for God. Okay. So it was God mocking those people. But be careful when someone PWCs. They could be PWCing just a teaching, and you have to actually come to them and say, okay, that sounds good, good words and fair speeches. Yes, you were able to grab, like, uh, for this situation here, Paul always named names. And yes, you were able to grab it from a verse where Paul did name names. But what about these other verses? Because there was so much more I could have grabbed that showed that Paul did not name names all the time. He did sometimes. But did he do it all the time? No. But here's the number one point I want you to take away from this study. A, Paul didn't always name names. Use spiritual judgment. That's one thing. Use spiritual discernment. To know when to name names and when not to name names. Remember that. 
But the number two thing that I want you to take away from this is once again, if someone comes out and says, Thus saith the Lord, the scriptures, Paul was always, a, he always named names. Jesus, uh, in his earthly ministry, mocked people, uh, this or that. What's supposed to be our attitude, brothers and sisters Christ? Acts 17.10. Turn to Acts 17.10. I told you we'd be coming back to this verse again. Acts 17.10. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogues of the Jews. These Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. All readiness of mind. That's the first part. Here's the second part that matters. Yes, you can listen to people like me that preach the word of God. I'm not saying don't listen to anybody, you just need this and that's it. I'm saying there's two parts to it. They receive the Word of God with all readiness of mind. I want you to receive what I've been teaching in this study. But what are you supposed to do after that? And search the Scriptures daily whether those things are so. Am I using Scripture? Am I taking Scripture out of context? Am I leaving out Scripture? Paul always named names, and I'm only going to grab one verse where he named names to justify me saying, Paul always named names. Am I leaving verses out? Whoever makes that statement are leaving verses out. There's plenty of verses where Paul doesn't name names. Jesus didn't name names. He, had, he was talking about the Sadducees, the priests and the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, I'm sorry, the priests and the Pharisees. He was talking about them, but he didn't name them by name. Amen? But this is Christ. When someone says, Thus saith the Lord, or this is absolute truth, this is supposed to be our final authority, okay? And also note what we just read there in Acts 17.10. Paul not naming names, but he's used, once again, Paul names names. But this is an example of Paul's not naming names. He's naming a group of people. By using a group of people as a bad example, the Thessalonians, and a group of people as a good example, the Bereans. But he's not naming names as far as individuals. Well, why don't you name individual names of people who love the Word of God and, and individual names of people who stray from the Word of God? He's just showing two types of people, and he's using them as a good example, the Bereans, and as a bad example, the Thessalonians. They received his Word, but they didn't check to make sure that what he was saying was truth, which means the Thessalonians were easier to be deceived. That's why Demas left, had forsaken Paul, for the Thessalonica, because they're easier to deceive. I believe that. They're easier to deceive. Okay. So, brothers and sisters of Christ, that's it for this study. Remember, when someone says something, no matter how outrageous it is, it might be true. There's times where I'm like, that can't be true. And I find out after uh, searching the scriptures daily to see if those things are so, I'm like, they're right. That is truth. But there's times where people have made wild claims, and I'm like, uh, chapter and verse on that? And I've had to do my own Bible study just to make sure, because like I said, some people can take verses out of context. Some people can quote some verses and leave other, and purposely leave other verses out. I'm not going to name names, but I know a brother in Christ that said Jesus should have been named Emmanuel. And he purposely left out the verses where... Um, Joseph and Mary were both commanded to name the child Jesus, and he said that they were in sin for naming him Jesus because they were supposed to name him Emmanuel. He purposely left out verses. You had to do your own study to say, wait a second, that, uh, you left verses out. They might say verses that are in the Bible, and you say, okay, that must be it. No, you still need to study the scriptures and make sure they're not leaving verses out. Okay? That they're, that they're taking verses in context, they're not leaving out verses. Okay? They're comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. It's called rightly dividing. That's how you take verses out of context when you don't rightly divide. Okay? So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. I thank the brethren for the prayer. I thank you for all the support you've given me and my love for you which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next study.